So today I'll be speaking to you all about invasives in Tobago. Okay. Now in 2012 I gave this presentation and uh, it was well received. I made some reference to Tobago at the end of it. Pay attention to the statement I made here in my conclusion slide. However, this is no longer the situation. Okay. Sad to say I was wrong. Now, I have a background in aquaculture as well, and the, the same reasons tilapia is a good aquaculture species makes it a good candidate for being invasive. It can tolerate a wide range of habitat, reproduces readily, and in 1990 it was introduced to Tobago as an aquaculture species for food industry. Philip documented it in 1998 in the Scarborough region. And then we observed it in 2004 and 2012. And then we have anecdotal evidence saying it was also in the Hillsborough Dam in 1994. Currently, this is the largest freshwater species of fish in Tobago. Now, we have two species of turret snails in Tobago, both invasive. Both species came to the island uh, accidentally in the ornamental fish trade um, with ornamental plants for the, for, for the pet trade. And this one here is Melanoides tuberculata. Bass documented it in 2003 at several sites. Pay attention to what happens to Charlottesville and Bonacourt area. Okay. And then in 2012, we documented it at these sites. Similar to what Bass indicated, but we see it now in the north part of the island as well. And then we have the other turret snail, Terribia. Now, this species closely resembles the previous one, which is a stockier shell, but it wasn't previously documented by Bass in 2003. And in 2012, we have it widespread all over the island, again in Charlottesville, but not yet in Bonacord, in south of the island. Now, the densities of both species can range. We found it in sites where it's up to 1,200 individuals per square meter. And when it gets to this density, it means that other organisms in the river doesn't have access to the substrate. It decreases the dissolved oxygen, basically makes it a very poor habitat for any other species, particularly the other native gastropods, the other native snails in the river systems. And then we have the golden apple snail, which is in the ornamental trade. This species, unlike the previous two, came to the island intentionally in the ornamental trade. And we, st we saw it only in the south part of the island. Now what's interesting, when it was first documented in the south part of the island, it was present with other native spe species, particularly Promethea ursias. And we found it in shallow ditches during the dry season. And what was interesting, the native species, both Promethea ursias and Marissa species, they were dying because of desiccation and because of the harsh environment, and these were surviving. So it means these were very resistant to, to harsh environments. Now, I told you all earlier, pay attention to Bonaco and Charlottesville area. In this area, we see three invasive settling. And the reason to settle is because this is a limestone coralline natural spring. Gastropods like calcium, and this area is strong, has a high calcium density. And we have another invasive plant, the noni fruit, present at the site. And noni fruit is high in amino acids, and this is protein building blocks. All three species, tilapia and the two snail species, were feeding on the fruits and leaves of, of the plants. So this provided a habitat and a w basically a wild laboratory type setting to test the enemy release hypothesis, where an exotic is introduced to a range and can rapidly reproduce. You have a, a boom in expansion because of a lack of predator and parasite pressure. And this means that the exotic species, they now are released from their natural enemies, parasites or, or, or predators. And in all cases, the exotic fish, the snails, they have no predators or parasites at the site. And they have an adequate food resource, and they have no native competitors. 
On the other side of the island, in Charlottesville, we have a different scenario. Charlottesville is typically a reef area and you have a rocky shore. There's a small river leading onto the rocky shore and both invasive species were present in Charlottesville. The, these being the two species of turret snails. At the rocky shore, we have these two hermit crabs, marine species, Tricolor and Vifitatus. Now, in the early 2000s, 2010, 2011, both species had roughly the same population densities on the rocky shore. But then when we started to see the two species of turret snails, particularly after flushing events, heavy rains, we had these snails washing onto the rocky shore. And eventually they die, they go into the seawater and die. But then we started to see an increase in this guy because he started, both, speci both species started to use the invasive shells, but then we started to see this one having an increased population. And this just gives an indication of how many hermit crabs we started to see in localized areas. And you see that the, both species are hermit crabs using the invasive species shells. And this, was, this is the first time documented in the Caribbean, an invasive having a positive impact on a different taxa. But now I'll talk a little bit about aquaculture, the potential threats for Tobago. Now, the Malaysian prawn, again, is an aquaculture species, and in Trinidad was introduced, and it, it escaped from aquaculture facilities. Now, the interesting thing, this species of prawn needs brackish water to complete the life cycle. And because Trinidad doesn't have the best water quality, particularly on the west coast, the, these animals didn't, they didn't colonize as rapidly, and they have small, non-expanding populations. However, in Tobago, because of the proximity to the coastline and the good water quality, there's a lot better habitat. So it means if this species was poorly managed in Tobago, it could have a negative impact on the native macrobrachian species. And then we have the Australian red claw. Unlike the macrobrachian species, this one doesn't require brackish water to complete the life cycle. There's no wild populations in Trinidad, again, possibly because we have such bad water quality in most of the drainage systems. But if this species would get to Tobago, it could have the same effect like what we see happening in Jamaica, where this species is a problem. Now we look at the pet trade. The red, the red head pod slider has been documented as a, an alien invasive in several climates, in several territories, temperate and tropical habitats. It has been documented in Trinidad, but we have no breeding populations. And the species is breeding in captivity in Trinidad and in also imported for the pet trade. Tobago, as far as we know, has no n native surviving turtle populations. But if this species was to escape in Tobago, it could have a negative impact on other species, such as the prawns in Tobago, the native prawns. The sudden painted turtle, again, is a, is a more do, docile animal. It is less aggressive in comparison to red airborne slider. It is in the, in the pet trade. However, interestingly enough, I've only ever seen it being sold in Tobago, not in Trinidad. So again, if this would to get out because of poorly managed, it, would, it could pose a problem. Now, the theme of today's workshop is appropriate practices for eradication, management, and control. I believe prevention is better than cure because for the other two species, both species of snails that we saw today, um, we can't manage it. The population explodes too fast. Um, when I said 1,200 individuals per square meter, that's adults. The juveniles, it could range up and we found it, we stopped counting at 1,000, okay? So what I, have, what I suggest is this. We know that the Fisheries Act has some gaps. Currently, three species of fish you need permission officially and or there's some level of restriction to import. The sunfish, which has no ornamental potential or aquaculture importance. Piranha, which has some ornamental importance because it's an oddity, but it is a, it is a predator species, so if it gets out into Trinidad's waterway, it would cause a problem. And goldfish, which I think ev almost everyone in this room had some interaction to goldfish in, in their lifetime so far. But yet, you, 
it is somewhat restricted to import in Trinidad. But all it needs, all it requires really a permit to import it from director of fisheries. But it means that because these particular species are highlighted, there is need for review of the Fisheries Act. And I have some suggestions here. A red list indicating where private ownership is not allowed. An orange list where private ownership is allowed with the inspection of holding facilities. A yellow list where breeding is allowed for, for, for food production, ornamental, and uh, once inspection facility is provided. And a green list where import and export and breeding is allowed. Obviously, these lifts will be uh, would be infinite because every once, every time someone wants to import a species, you you basically create determine which category you put the species in. But then you determine what management you you employ for the different species. So, in conclusion, I'd say that aquaculture in Tobago needs to be managed, particularly for prawn and crayfish. But it has to be bought by the private sector and the public sector. The pet trade for, for aquatic ornamentals, including plants and animals, needs regulating. And lastly, our animal trade between both islands needs to be regulated as well. So I'd like to thank you now. These are my assistants.